tonight we have another amateur telescope um, legend. Um, this gentleman is um, well known to many of you as well. And we'd like to welcome Richard. He's going to talk tonight on imaging and, and viewing the Milky Way. This is uh, a talk that he likes to give, and uh, we hopefully can see the Milky Way this evening. Thanks, Thanks Mike, um, for inviting me here, and thank you to Nova, Novak for um, bringing me over here. Um, and I would like to extend a, an invitation to those of you who may want to come west where the sky is darker and up to 6,000 foot elevation to the Oregon Star Party um, next year. I think you'd really get a kick out of it. It's a very different kind of environment. Um, you're up at 6,000 foot elevation. There is no water, no electricity within 40 miles. Uh, and there's 800 amateur astronomers on top of a peak what's called scab land, and the sky is fantastic. Okay, what we're going to talk about tonight is what you'll be able to see later on this evening, which is the Milky Way. Um, and what I want to do is to help you see the Milky Way better than you see it now. Um, uh, by giving you a better sense of what's going on with it. Um, well, what is the Milky Way? Well, basically it's a band of, in a, in a simple way, it's a band of light that circles the sky and the ancient Greeks and Romans um, gave it names that were associated with milk. Um, the Milky Circle from the Greeks, um, the Via Lactea, Path of Milk or Milky Road of the Romans. Um, and Galileo, with his telescope, uh, shortly after putting it into operation, um, found that its light was not milk smooth, but came from many individual stars. However, to see it properly, you must be far from city lights. Almost every story that talks about light pollution nowadays talks about how our children have not seen the Milky Way. And yet every kid who grew up on a farm 40, 50, 60 years ago knew the Milky Way as a bright band of light. Well, the Milky Way spans the entire sky, and when you see it this evening, you'll see it rising over in the southwest, crossing the sky through Cygnus straight overhead, and down into Cassiopeia and Perseus in the early evening. And yet, at detail, there's all sorts of complex and delicate structures. We do have a problem, by the way, with light pollution in this speaking environment. Um, so you'll have to put up with that. that. The North American Nebula is there in Deneb. Um, visible. Hopefully we'll be able to see the computer graphics well enough that you'll be able to uh, make some sense of it. Okay, well, let's go back and ask that question again. What is the Milky Way? Well, it is a spiral galaxy. We live in it. It's a rather average galaxy in size. And we live somewhere out in the suburbs of the galaxy. In 1905, nobody knew any of that. So a hundred years ago, this was all new stuff, or it was rather not known stuff. 1905, the consensus of astro what astronomers thought was the universe. They didn't know it was a galaxy by itself. They said, well, the universe is a flattened disk of stars. Its diameter is somewhere around 30,000 light years. And they thought, well, if there were other things that might be galaxies, that was inconceivably distant, so it couldn't be true. And therefore, all the whole universe had to be comprised of the Milky Way, or the, rather the Milky Way comprised the entire universe. S spiral nebulae, which they could see, and have been seen since Lord Ross had observed them with his Leviathan, they thought those were gas, gas clouds swirling together to form stars. Young stars were red as they age, they turned blue. They shrank, got hotter. And the sun was somewhere near the center of the universe. Sound familiar? We live downtown Washington. Oh, too bad. Well, this is light pollution that is worse. Okay, this is the universe as it appeared in 1905. 
Okay, the universe is a brown oval here. There's 30,000 light years. There's the sun in the center, and you can see all the stars. These are guys, little guys here, these are the spiral nebulae. And then something terrible, well, okay. However, globular clusters suggest that otherwise. If you look at where the globular clusters are, if you think about your Messier book and stuff like that, you realize that they're in Ophiuchus, they're in Sagittarius, they're all clustered in one chunk of the sky. Harlow Shapley, an astronomer at Harvard, measured their distances and said, you know, their average distance is, I don't know, 100,000 light years away. If they are centered on the Milky Way, if they're part of the Milky Way system, then the Milky Way is maybe 300,000 light years across, and we're not in the center anymore. Even then, astronomers suspected that some of the external nebulae, um, uh, uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, Small Magellanic Cloud, NGC uh, 6822, were other galaxies. But most astronomers were not focused on stuff so far away and so hard to imagine. The other thing is, they didn't have the 100-inch telescope. Here was the universe in 1920. Okay, there's, there would be the outline of the flattened disk of stars. These would be the globular clusters around its center, and here's the sun. You know, it's the old Copernican thing, we're out of the middle again. It just keeps going downhill. <laughs> well, in 1918, the, the, the 100-inch telescope was put into operation, and a young astronomer who um, locked into uh, a position on, at, on the observatory staff, began to survey M31, and he noticed what he thought, well, he noticed that there were what he initially thought was a nova in this thing, which was supposed to be just the place where a star was forming in M31. Well, if there's a nova, a star, in something, that means that the galaxy, that the, the M31 had to be distant well, the landmark papers about this were published in 1925, 1926. Spiral nebulae were external galaxies like our own. And overnight, basically, within a couple of years, the whole paradigm shifted. All of a sudden, the Milky Way was one galaxy among many. One of the quickest revolutions in science that's ever happened. Well. Here's our Milky Way galaxy now. Now you've got the thin, flattened disk. It's 100,000 light years across. Here's the globular clusters. Here we are up in the suburbs. So now in 2005, here's our picture. Okay, Milky Way is a fairly large spiral, not the biggest. Andromeda is actually bigger. Uh, M33, the triangular galaxy, is smaller. About 30,000 kiloparsecs, 100,000 light years across weighs half a trillion solar masses. If people who like weird esoteric notations might like to know it's an SABBRS, get type galaxy, and I'll, I'll sort of talk about that, means it has moderately open spiral arms, it's got a weak central bar, like a barred spiral, and it has a weak central ring, it's got a massive black hole, uh, three million solar masses in the middle, and it's a member of the local group with M31, M33, and about 20, well, two or three dozen teeny weeny pipsqueak galaxies. So there's three big guys and two dozen, three dozen little ones. Well, here's a picture now. This is out of the computer model. And you can see there's spiral arms coming out from the center. The yellow circles here are the globular clusters and a big halo around it. 100,000 light years across, and we are here. Now, there's other little symbols in there, and I'll talk about those. Those are the things that we look at in our telescopes as objects. And one of the key things you need to understand when you look at the Milky Way is you look at M17, you look at M16, you look at the lagoon, you look at the 
the, the, the um, North American Nebula and say, well, here's an object. There's another object. All of a sudden, when you think of it galactically, they aren't objects. They're just parts of the system. Okay, so I'm a human being altogether, and the object is my thumb or my hair or something like that. So instead of looking at those individual parts, you want to begin to think of all those galactic clusters, all those globulars, all those emission regions and star forming things, that's all part of one big system. Not individual, well they're individual, but they're part of a system also. Okay, components. What are the things that make it up? Okay, the things that you can't see easily are grayed back, and the things you can see are brighter. Okay, the nucleus with its black hole, we can't see directly into it because between us and it is a lot of gas that has dust in it, and it obscures it, it darkens it down. The light from the, the center of the galaxy can't get out to us. However, the stars that surround the, that core can get out, and we can see the central bulge. The three kiloparsec ring of hot gas that surrounds its center, we can't see that either because it, A, it's obscured, and B, its principal emissions are visible in radio light. In other words, radio astronomers can look at that, but we human beings can't. There's a thick disk, and that's all the old stars you see. There's a thin disk, and that's all the Messier objects and stuff that you look at tend to be part of that thin disk. Uh, that's the arms, the young stars, the gas, the dust, the lagoon nebula, all that, all those kind of guys. And then the halo stars, those are the oldest stars in the galaxy, and they are forming a great big halo that surrounds the entire thing. And then finally the dark matter halo, this is the 500 pound gorilla, presumably has something in the order of 90% of its mass. This is non-light radiating material. Gravitationally it's there, we know it because the way stars orbit the center of the galaxy is affected by it, but it doesn't glow, it's dark. Losing the edges of stuff, but you can see just enough. Okay, um, here's the galaxy edge on the, the disk of the galaxy, the thin disk. That is where all the activity, all the neat stuff is going on. Is about the same thickness to diameter ratio as a CD. It's very thin. The thick disk, which has the older stars, which have been stirred up, is about as thick as a pancake. If you <laughs> Imagine the CD-ROM and then you imagine a pancake. Pancakes are much thicker than CD-ROMs, except in for crafts. Okay, and then, and then you have the central bulge, which if you continue with this analogy, which is already getting out of hand, um, is sort of like the yolk in the fried egg. Excepting it's double-sided, it goes down as well as up, and symmetrical. And then the little blip in the middle, um, is the nucleus, which we can't see from here. Um, thank goodness we have the Chandra X-ray satellite that's now looking in detail at those structures in the core. Um, this is us out here in the suburbs. There's, the spiral arms are coming out. Here's the, where the ring of gas is, and here's this not very barry bar. It's a sort of an extension, and we're looking down on it at about a 15 degrees off of its axis. Well, I've talked about dust, okay, blocking views of stuff. Well, that's terrible because you can't, it's, it's the classic case you can't see the forest for the trees, or actually you can't see the forest for the fog. This stuff that's in space between us and the stars restricts what we can see to somewhere between a tenth and a quarter of the galaxy's diameter typically. So our view is generally rather limited at least optically. Um, however, what the other galaxies tell us is what we might, what our galaxy would, is rather, 
if it is a typical galaxy. But if you can't see enough of our galaxy to tell what it's like, how can you tell which of the other galaxies it's like? So it's a tricky question. So in our galaxy, our view is blocked by dust. But we look out in the other galaxies, we can see lots of different examples. We can sort of try them on for size. We can find one that fits. So other galaxies are what really tell us what our galaxy looks like much more accurately although not in the same precision. It's like saying, well, there's an automobile out there. You say, well, what kind of automobile? Well, I don't know, but it's got four tires, it's got an engine in the front, that's an automobile. It's sort of generic thing. We know what, what its components are, we can't tell exactly its detail, what type of car it is. Well, of the spiral type galaxies, which we're pretty sure we've got, there's, there's three broad types. There's a grand design spiral. That's the one they put in the textbooks. The basic reason, I think, is that art directors like spiral galaxies. <laughs> and they like the grand design spiral galaxies because they're symmetric and they have two nice arms and they spiral really well. Then there's the flocculent spirals. And these things are so messed up. You can hardly tell they're spirals at all. Flocculent means, oh, what does it mean? <laughs> Cloudy, broken up. Yeah, sort of like cottage cheese dropped on the floor. Okay. It has a spirality. You can see that there are spiral bits, but nowhere can you make out a clear shape. And then finally, there's the, what are called the multi-arm spirals, of which this is a reasonably good example, and probably fairly similar to our galaxy. And you'll notice it has a bar. It also has partial ring of stars there. And then you can see that there's several spiral arms coming out. What this, one of the things that, this, that, that makes the multi-arm spirals different than the grand design spirals the arms in grand design spirals are really nice. And the arms in the multi-arm spirals are halfway to being like those flocculent things where an arm goes off and then you say, well, wait a minute. That one goes out there, but where did this one come from? Then here's this piece sticking out. There's all sorts of spurs and branches and kind of <coughs> half messed up stuff. So when we try to map our galaxy, one of the things we have to remember, one of the things we have to be aware of, is that it's not going to turn out to be a pretty picture. It's kind of a mess. OK, so it's not a grand, grand design spiral. It's too irregular. We can, we'll, we'll be able to we'll see pictures here and see why that is. It's not a flocculent spiral because there is too much structure for it to be flocculent. It's probably a multi-arm. There's probably, and there's papers published on this where um, actually the number of astronomers who think it's one kind versus another has been plotted versus year and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, how do you get a, a, a grip on this thing? Um, it probably has four arms. They probably spiral outwards about 12 degrees relative, uh, at an at angle 12 degrees relative to a, what a circle would have. Um, the bulge that is the central part, probably has a weak bar. That's actually quite well established. Um, and there's probably a weak ring. The three kiloparsec arm, so-called, which is actually a ring, that's actually 3.7 kiloparsecs. Always be careful of nomenclature. Well, let's look a little bit about what spiral arms are. Well, spiral arms lie in the plane of the galaxy. If you take a chart your star maps, and you plot all the the red nebulas, all the uh, gas forming areas, M8, M20, M16, M17, the North American Nebula, all those guys, you'll find that from where we're looking, they are all basically in a straight line. They're confined to a very narrow plane. And that plane, knowing that that type of objects are what define spiral arms in other galaxies, then presumably those are the same things that define what a spiral galaxy is in 
or what a spiral arm is in our galaxy. They're full of hot, young O and B type stars. Those are the, the ones that shine bright and blow up young. Um, the H2 regions, your, your red nebulas, um, in other galaxies, just strung out in the arms like beads on a chain is the term that's been used. You, you just see them one after another. If you go out on the web and you look at the recent magnificent Hubble picture that's been published of M51, you will see these things. Here's a spiral arm, and it's like boop, 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 boop. They just plug them in every five or six kiloparsecs right all around the arms. They have cold molecular clouds, which we can see in radio. And they have dust clouds spread along the inner edge. In our spiral galaxy, when we look in, almost anywhere we look in, we're looking into dust clouds. We're not seeing what's further in. When we turn around and look away from the center of the galaxy, we almost always have a clear view. with just a little bit of dust and gas. And when we look at other galaxies, we find that along the inner edges of the spiral arms, we see dust clouds. One of the things that tells us is we're not at the inner edge of the spiral galaxy, I mean, of the arm. We are somewhere outwards of the inner edge. Well, here is a plot of the Milky Way spiral arms. And I'll break it down by category. Um, center is there, and then you have a number of different what they call spiral arm tracers or spiral arm indicators all plotted on here. Um, the, best, the best plots, probably the most reliable, um, are what's called electron density ridges. Um, it measures where there's most ionized gas, that is gas that's been heated, that has an electron free, and they can actually measure how many electrons are between here and another place if in the other place there's a pulsar. And because the pulsars go on a regular basis, if you look at them in different wavelengths of radio, the pulses arrive at slightly different times, electrons retard the radio emission slightly, and you can measure how many electrons between here and there. And then, by simply looking at 500 for pulsars spread out all over the place, you can figure out where the maxima of electrons are and basically generate a map. Okay, and all the other objects are old clusters, young clusters, all sorts of other things that we find in spiral arms. So here's the simple, here's a group of them. There's the center of the galaxy, and this is the O and B associations, these hot young stars that have formed recently. There's the sun, and there's a sort of an arm, and there's a sort of an arm, and there's a sort of an arm. You can say, well, okay, I see three spiral arms passing through this area. Sort of. It's not very convincing. Then you look at where the young star clusters are. The old star clusters are not good because they wander from where they were formed. The young star clusters are still pretty much where they started. Okay, and you say, well, okay, I can see that there's a, a locus of stuff going through here. And maybe there's some more stuff there. Well, I, I could maybe convince myself there's a few more sort of a line there. But of course, somebody else can say, well, you know, I see a line here. Not very convincing by itself. These are the H2 regions, the M16s, the M17s, all those guys. There's the center of the galaxy, there's the sun. Well, you can see they, these guys line up here. This is fairly convincing that there's, there's some arm-type stuff in here. By itself, not particularly convincing. Now, this is a survey of, we have, in the optical, we have H alpha. Well, if you go up 110 electron levels, you'll have H110 alpha. It's the analogous line, excepting it's a radio line. They surveyed part of the sky. So you can see there's a cone coming out from the sun. And look at this. There's a nice line of stuff. There's a cluster of stuff. 
neutral hydrates, and this color doesn't show up well, unfortunately, but you can see there's deep purple stuff all out there around the edges. And the neutral hydrogen, that is hydrogen which is not ionized, which is hydrogen atoms, um, this is able to look out far from the center of the galaxy and see, you know, when you look at pictures of galaxies, you see they have the very outer spiral arms. This is presumably mapping some of that. And here's the molecular clouds. These are the cold gas from which stars will eventually form. And again, you see, well, hmm, how does this one go? There's the center. This, is a, this was another survey. It was done out that way. You say, well, why didn't these guys just survey the whole sky? Well, unfortunately, you have to be in the southern hemisphere to see this part of the Milky Way. And you have to have more money to be able to run your radio telescope for many, many years to survey that part of the sky. And then here's the free electrons, uh, which is just, you know, probably the raw data look pretty messy. But by the time they put some nice spline curves through it, it looks really cool. And here we are. Interesting thing here, we're not in a spiral arm anymore. Notice that if you count free electrons, we miss the boat. We're not in an arm. Well, let's lay all those all those tracers on top of one and you get a picture like this. When you put them all together, the picture is much more convincing than if you take anything by itself. So here they are. This is an outer arm of sorts. You have a nice, I mean, this is, this is cool. I wonder really is well defined. This one comes around. And you can see all through all those giant molecular clouds. Notice it's got a flat spot on it. But remember, those multi-arm spirals, they don't have well-behaved arms. They have these anomalies. And then here, stuck in this funny little thing out here, is a sort of an alignment of stuff. That's where we are. That's now used to be called the Orion arm, and they thought it was a whole spiral arm, and they tried to connect it with, with this and that and the other thing. But it looks like it's just a little chunk, a disconnected chunk of arm that didn't really get finished. Um, and the, the going name for it right now is the local arm. <laughs> and then here's the edge-on view of all those tracers. Remember I said they're, they're confined to a narrow plane? Well, yes, they are. There's, but notice, whoops, we got a warp. Out at the extreme edges, the neutral hydrogen disk is warped, presumably because of gravitational interactions with something like M31. Um, and you've probably read, we will eventually collide with that guy if we don't get lucky and somehow escape. What is it, 10 billion years from now we collide with the Andromeda galaxy? It's before, it's not, not next Thursday, I'll tell you that. Okay, well, purple doesn't show very well here, but you can still see. Here's the H2 regions lying on top of, of the spiral arms. Um, and in this model now, we'll show we have thrown in and the blue, um, and in the yellow, we've thrown in um, some of the other components to help clarify the picture. That's the picture I'll be showing you as we go along. So where do we live? Well, you put all those things together and you apply some numbers. Um, we live 8,500 parsecs, although the number is sometimes quoted as 8,000 parsecs, 27,700 light years down to about 25,000, 24,000. Uh, light years from the center of the galaxy. Um, the speed in orbit, as the best number I can find, it's cons quoted consistently as 220 kilometers a second, um, which is what, 150 um, miles per second. Pretty fast. It takes about a quarter of a billion years. So since the formation of the galaxy 10 billion years ago, roughly, um, we've gone around something like 20 times. Um, the local arm is an inter, what's called an inner arm spur. Um, and the best clues come from the star forming regions, the H2 regions. Uh, from radio measurements, radio is very important. We would still be lost in the forest without radio astronomy. And infrared mapping, which has turned out to be also exceedingly crucial. The reason is that radio goes through right through the dust clouds like it's not even there. And the infrared goes through the dust clouds 
like it's barely there. So those two longer wavelengths let us see through all this fine dust. When we say dust, what we're really talking about is fine particles, micron-sized particles, roughly the size of cigarette smoke particles, excepting maybe it's one particle per cubic meter, very spread out. On the other hand, when you look through many, many, many light years, many thousands of light years of it, it becomes quite opaque. Like the nucleus of our galaxy is dim by 30 magnitudes relative to what it would be if that dust were not there. So here's a, this is part of a, now a computer model which I'll sort of use because when you're sitting down here stuck on the earth, stuck orbiting the, uh, orbiting the sun, the sun's stuck orbiting the center of the galaxy, you can't get the, the eagle's eye view, you can't get the big picture. So what you do is you make a computer model, let you fly up and out, and take a look down, and look back and see where the heck things are. So nomenclature is terrible because no two astronomers can really agree on what the arms are called either. Um, this you, in some of the literature you'll find that this is out here, the one you can't see, is the Roman numeral one, this is a Roman numeral two, that's the Roman three, Roman four, Roman five. It's just number uh, the nomenclature that seems to work best is this arm in here, defined by the um, giant molecular clouds, is the inner arm. This is usually called the Norma arm. You say, well, who is Norma? What was she doing? Um, Norma is one of the, con the constellations in the southern hemisphere. And where this arm becomes endwise to us, so that we're looking down through a thick view of it, is in the constellation Norma. Then the Sagittarius arm, which we call the Sagittarius arm because we look towards Sagittarius, we're looking right through it, and it's closest. <laughs> See, this is nomenclature that's quite inconsistent. Then here's the local arm with us in it, this little spur. And then looking outward, you have the Perseus arm. And sometimes the literature will find that there's there's another arm, so-called the outer arm, referred to. Okay, well, you can observe the Milky Way. We're going to see it tonight. Looks like it's going to be pretty good, pretty good viewing. And its major features, the really key stuff in it, is all naked eye objects. So, you know, forget those telescopes. You don't have to win this raffle. You can see this stuff with your naked eye. Okay. The major things you'll be able to see are star clouds, which are dense conglomerations of stars. When Galileo looked through his telescope, this is the kind of thing he was looking at. He'd look at that and he'd say, wow, there's a lot of stars there. Um, although, considering he was observing with about a one-inch telescope, you know, anything he could see, you can see better with a pair of 50, uh, 10 by 50 binoculars. So if you look at those star clouds with 10 by 50s, you will see they're not milky. They're starry. The dark nebulae, the dark nebulae are so big that people don't see them. And I'll point that out to you. Um, the in in Aquila, for example, you look at it and say, ah, oh, gee, the Milky Way is very bright there. When you take deep photographs, you can really see it well. You realize the Milky Way is there, excepting in front of it is a dark, great big dark cloud. This is blocking it. It turns out that dark cloud is dust. It's about 200 parsecs, about 600 light years from us. Blocking our view of what's behind it. The H2 regions, a lot of these you can see um, in binoculars or the telescope. Uh, open clusters. Um, binoculars, some of the brighter ones are naked eye, like M7. And globular clusters, centered on, on Sagittarius. M10, M11, M13's an anomaly. It's further out, um, but it's still in the same hemisphere as the center of the galaxy. And nobody knows about any globular clusters out there in Cassiopeia, right? Think about your observing book. Are there globular clusters in Cassiopeia? No, it's the wrong way. That's out. Well, here's a bad case of light pollution. This is what the sky will look like from Washington. Um, you're, and I, I'm afraid that many of the pictures 
um, later on will be equally hard to see, but summer evenings, when you look to the south, there's a fairly distinctive group of stars, the teapot. Even its interstellar lines are hard to see. Can you see the teapot there, though? Okay. Um, in the early summer, it's getting a little bit late here in, in October now, but we'll see, we'll see Sagittarius going down. Um, that's your real guide to the Milky Way. Um, okay, there's Sagittarius. The galactic center is right there off the teapot. It's right there in the spout. If you look carefully, you will see many dark sites the cloud of steam coming out of the pot, out of the spout. Okay, that is what's called the large Sagittarius star cloud. In terms of astronomy, that is the edge of the central bulge of our galaxy. This region in here, where the actual center of the galaxy is, that's blocked off. But the outer edge of the central bulge is still visible, shining through. Um, and if you look at color pictures, in their published magazines and stuff, you will see that as you go outward, further along, away from the, from the plane of the Milky Way, the star clouds look whitish or slightly yellowish. As you get in closer, they begin to look orange or brown because interstellar dust reddens the light, and so those are areas that are being partially blocked. If you look a little further up above Sagittarius, you'll see the small Sagittarius star cloud. And then you look further up still, and you'll see the Scutum star cloud. Um, each of those is readily visible to the eye. This is a deeper, deeper exposure. Here's, here's um, Sagittarius again. There's the large Sagittarius star cloud. Okay, notice that further out, on either there's there's the the, the uh, equator of the galaxy. Further out, the star clouds are bluish or whitish. As you get in closer, you see this yellowing where the the light is being blocked. I mean, even as you look outside now, you'll see an orangey color to the sunlight. It's not white anymore. It's being yellowed or orange by absorption by the aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. Same thing's happening in space. And then, okay, here's objects that almost everybody, M M7, um, Lagoon, the Triffid. Um, I can't remember the guy's number, it's a little cluster. Maybe yeah, but, oh. PowerPoint, you're letting me down. Labels are supposed to appear. <laughs> um, here's M24. This guy, by the way, my favorite name for him is the goggle-eyed monster, because I see him as a, as a big mouth opening up and you know, a pair of dark goggles on. And then M16 and M17 up there. And then, because we're in the direction of Cygnus, I mean, in, in, in Sagittarius, um, we have M22, and then down in here, there's about five more. Consult your, consult your favorite observing guide, and you'll find a whole stack of, of globular clusters in there. Okay, here's this same scene. I've turned it sideways now so that the, the plane of the Milky Way runs through like this. Now we're seeing Sagittarius. This is what this scene looks like in visible light. If you go to the infrared region of the spectrum, this is exactly the same scene at almost exactly the same scale. It's an overlap. Okay, you can still see that there's dark clouds in the foreground. This bulgy thing here, that is the central bulge of our galaxy. This is the thin disk. The light is, is from the thin disk, and the thick disk will be a little bit bigger further out. And even in the infrared, you'll see that, that there are dust clouds that are so dense that they block the light from behind. Let me go back so you can see that comparison. Okay, there it is in visible light. 
There it is in infrared. Same scene. And then here's a computer model as seen from the sun. The yellow circles are all the globular clusters. Um, the thin disk uh, stars are in here in blue. There's the bulge um, in the computer model. And this is the way we see it looking from our sun. Okay, here's exactly the same model now seen from straight overhead. The sun is now here. Okay, the globulars are all projected down onto the plane. And you can see all those red nebulas and star clusters and everything like that all pile on top of one another. So here's a sort of grand picture of uh, the Milky Way. When we look from here to the center, this is the direction of Sagittarius. When we look this way, that's the direction of Cygnus. So if we go outside and we look towards Sagittarius, we're looking this way. If we look up more into Scutum, we're looking this way. If we look up into Aquila, we're seeing this way. If we look up into Cygnus, we're seeing this way. In other words, where you look depends what you see in the galaxy depends depends on which way you look. And you get very different views depending on what you're looking at. Um, you can think of yourself standing on the mall in Washington, and when you look this way, you see one thing, and when you turn around and look another way, you see a different thing. Same thing happens in space. People say, well, the Milky Way, we're looking at the Milky Way, and we're looking at the Milky Way, we're looking at the Milky Way. But wait, when you look at the Milky Way here, and you look at the Milky Way here, you're looking at very different parts of it. You're inside the structure, and it's confusing. You need to have some sense, and this is very hard to get, of what this thing is as a three-dimensional structure and what happens when you look in different directions. And how those affect what you see. Well, this is, in order to make it easier to visualize, you can take the computer model and where we are right now, we are sitting 16 parsecs above the central plane of the galaxy. So I just said, okay, well, let's go up 100 times further up. What do we see? Well, instead of seeing everything all crammed together, we now see the close-by stuff spread out for a panorama before us. Now, distance is the other key thing that's hard to get a hold of. When you look at celestial objects, you don't have any way of telling how far away they are. You end up you know, you flip through the book, and the book says, oh, it's 350 light years, and you believe that number because you don't know any better. Okay, but when you look at a terrestrial scene, you don't have any problem. You know, the window's one and a half meters away from me. The clouds are 20 kilometers away, right? There's the window, there's the clouds. You know, just a few tiny bit of angle, and all of a sudden I'm looking many thousands of times further away from myself. There's the mountain four kilometers away. I should have done these in English measurements, right? <laughs> but we're going to be metric before long anyway, right? We take our medicines in metric. Recipes are starting to show up in metric, you know. Get used to it. <laughs> okay, here's the grass, three to ten meters away, the fence, the field. Everything's at a different distance. And the same thing holds when you look into space. So when you look at the Milky Way, you don't know, you don't have to know the numbers. Okay, all you have to do is to keep the terrestrial analogs in mind and keep in mind that they really are different distances. Think of this as close, this is middle distance, that's distant. Okay, so anytime you look at a, a galaxy, just, just think far, far, far away. Um, the near stuff blocks the middle stuff and the far stuff, right? if it's opaque. The middle stuff blocks the far stuff. Remember that space is transparent and remember that space is full of dust. Because in some places there's not much dust and in other places there's a lot of dust. It's all in your head. Okay. And you have to know when space is transparent and when it's full of dust. But the dust is pretty noticeable when you, when you 
look at it, right? Okay, here's a picture of the galaxy again. Okay, there's the galactic bulge, 27,000 light years away from us, right there. Straight shot through the edge. There's a globular cluster, 15,000 light years away. That'll be somewhere between us and the center. There's a dust cloud, the pipe nebula, 200 light years away. It's sitting in there blocking all this good stuff that's further away. Here's a couple of stars in the, in the uh, Scorpius Centaurus OB1 Association. That's a bunch of hot blue stars, 300 light years away. And these guys are moving rapidly enough that if you look at them for uh, a few decades, you'll actually see their motion across the sky. They're close by. Um, and this uh, star cloud, I think, I, I think it says 3,000 light years. That's the um, uh, that's the small Sagittarius star cloud. So stuff is all at different distances. I mean, here's the Lagoon Nebula at 5,000 light years. There's the near stuff. There's the middle stuff. There's the pretty middle stuff. And all that's left is the farthest stuff, the bold stuff. You can see that correlation. Want me to do that again? Come on, PowerPoint, do your thing. Okay. Here's the foreground stuff blocked out. Here's the middle stuff blocked out. And then finally you're left looking out to the bulge. Of course, if there's any galaxies in the scene, external galaxies, uh, they would be even further. And there's your composite scene. And you can often tell because the very, very large scale structure of these dark nebulae means they're probably close. These are probably not big. Doesn't guarantee it. Okay, but it's it's an indicator. Okay, the large scale structure of these big dark clouds in here probably indicates if not very close, they're at least not super far away. I get a rough sense, in other words. Um, Okay, well let's look at four objects that everybody likes to look at in a telescope. Okay, you've got the Lagoon Nebula, you've got the uh, Triffid Nebula, you got M16 and M17. Right? The, these are the four things that if you're out there on a nice warm, what would it be, August night, on a midnight, you're going to look to the south and you're going to see these things. And you're going to walk around the field. And, hey, I got I got an O3 filter on. We got M13, and I mean we got M17. And come over and look. Okay, I mean you know that's that's what you're going to hear. These are the things people are looking. At. Where are they? Well, here's the galaxy model. Okay, and there they are. They're lost down down in the traffic. Okay? Can't tell where they are. Everything's overlaid on top of one another. So let's go up 100 light years. Okay, now we're starting to see just a little bit of, of getting a little perspective on it. Let's go up 200 light years. Let's go up about 800 light years. Now you can begin to see how these things really are in space. M17, M16, and M8, they're all in the Sagittarius arm, the arm that comes just inside our arm. And M20, the Triffid, which is a lot smaller, by the way, than its little buddy and its buddy um, lagoon. It's further away. It's almost down into the next arm in. It's almost down into the Norma arm. And if you um, so, you can see. Well, you know, it's, it's reasonable that this guy would be further away if they're the same size, but you don't know. Okay. But then, what astronomers do, I mean, you know, they will have measured the distances carefully by looking at the same types of stars in these different objects, measuring their brightnesses, compensating for the absorbing gas, which can be done by measuring their redness, and then determining what the amount of gas would be, and therefore taking this back. And this is what they're paid to do, figure this stuff out. Um, and there's M16 and M17, so you've got 
all these things that are lying there, most of the stuff along the uh, Sagittarius arm, and then probably backgrounding them, most of this dark material here is probably behind those guys, because in front of them you wouldn't see them, and it's probably the dark clouds along the inside edge of the Sagittarius spiral arm. So you're looking into the, the depth and then there's something behind it, and that's why you don't see still further in excepting in some places where there's actually holes in the clouds or there's places where the clouds are not continuous and you can see deeper into the core, which is why you can see all the way into the central bulging places. Okay, well here's the, here's the sun again. Okay, and once again, there, there you are looking straight into Sagittarius. And there you are looking off into the about like that into the Cygnus direction. And here are these other angles. We've got, and down in Sagittarius, we've got all those objects. Now you ask the observer, okay, what are the good things to look at in Aquila? Right? Aquila is, should be off in here. I mean, there's lots of good stuff. It's a little further far away, but why don't we see it? We'll, we'll sort of pan around and go further over. We're just, we're just panning the model. We're looking further and further over. We should be looking sort of towards Cygnus by now. So at one point, we're going to pan, our, our view is going to pass across the Sagittarius spiral arm as it goes around the corner, and that's going to be the light that lays on top of itself to be a bright area of the Scutum star cloud. So we go further, so here's Aquila, and there's um, further. Okay, and here's the Scutum star cloud, and we're seeing this largely because there's a gap in some of this foreground stuff. You can see this foreground nebulosity here and here. And then this is a place not where there's something in front of dark material, but where the dark material isn't, and we see through to that more distant stuff. Now when you look above the screaming star cloud into Aquila, what happened there? That is actually a very large cloud, um, the Great Rift, which is actually quite close to us and blocks all of that stuff. This is why Aquila, which is all in here, isn't full of neat nebulas. It's all blocked out. So even though the galaxy itself would like to show us that stuff, we don't see it. And as you progress further along, from further from the eagle up to the swan, um, you've got the Sagittarius star, or rather the Cygnus star cloud. For a long time, astronomers in Great Britain and Ireland, famous observatories there, believed that the center of the Milky Way had to be in Cygnus because this is where the Milky Way was brightest, which is the impression you would get if you were at 55 degrees north latitude in a country that burned coal for heat <laughs> and um, basically <coughs> never saw the horizon, never saw Sagittarius. Um, they finally figured it out, um, more or less, when they uh, got into the southern hemisphere and started to see this stuff. So here's the Cygnus star cloud. This will be more or less straight overhead. Um, and if you look at it in binoculars, you'll see, or a telescope, just sweep across this. There's zillions of stars here. So this is just a beautiful thing to sweep across. No nebulas, no nothing. Just move your telescope across and watch the stars just parade by. What are you looking at? When you look into that area, well, remember I said, here's this little spur. All these objects that are in that spur, when we look towards Cygnus, we're looking right down through that region, and we see them all just compressed into space. So we, we look into the Cygnus direction, we see all that stuff. Okay, so we could... Then we've got the network nebula, we've got uh, all that stuff that every, every astrophotographer aspires to have a good picture of. That's 
all part of our little local guy. As we swing further around, which, you know, in the wee hours, we'll be seeing Cassiopeia and Perseus come up. You've got the uh, double cluster. You've got some of these neat little guys, the bubble nebula and stuff like that. What are we looking at there? Well, in our model now, we're looking away from the center of the sun. And I actually don't know which of these objects are those, but that's what they will be in this view. Very sparse, very thinned out view compared to looking toward the center of the galaxy. Here's two pictures toward the center of the galaxy and away from the center of the galaxy. Very, very different views. And then the Milky Way continues. Um, from the East Coast, as a kid, I was not even aware that the Milky Way went down past the Rhine. And it was, you know, I mean, you could read it in books, but you sure couldn't see it. Um, it does take those high, clear western skies to be able to see this stuff well. The Milky Way is actually quite bright as it runs down through past Orion, through Monoceros, and down into, into Canis Major. And as we swing our view further and further around, we'll eventually, having looked away from the center of the galaxy, now we'll be coming back into it, and all these wonderful objects here in the uh, uh, what is sometimes by other astronomers called the Carina spiral arm uh, become visible. If you go down to the southern hemisphere, you then see all this beautiful group of stuff um, coming in the Carina Nebula, the Colsat, which is a um, rather close and nearby uh, dark nebula. So as we, we summarize, here again is our picture of the Milky Way, and the direction we look and the distance to the things we see profoundly affect what we're, what we're able to see when we look through our telescopes. I think the thing that's probably most important is to recognize we're not looking at 150 or 250 or 350 objects in space, we're looking at components of a single thing, which is the Milky Way. Thanks. Um, questions? <laughs> You're going to be out there tonight. You'll be able to see this stuff, which is, um, which is nice. And when you look in the guidebooks, the guys who wrote the guidebooks are generally pretty smart. Um, but they had to write it, you know, like a chapter or a paragraph at a time. And it's very hard to write a paragraph that says, oh, by the way, you know, here's where this thing fits into the big picture. But as an observer, try to synthesize that big picture. Yes, question? Um, an invitation to speak here. <laughs> I've had a chance to visit um, my, my folks. I grew up on the East Coast, and my wife grew up on the East Coast. So, and um, heck, I mean, um, I first drove down Route 29 with my dad when I was going to uh, uh, start freshman year at UVA. So, you know. This is an area I know, so it was, it was nice to have a chance to come back. Yes? Um, I haven't, you can dig through mountains of professional papers to find this stuff. Um, and uh, Nigel Henbest and I can't remember the other author's name, did a book on the Milky Way with mm -hmm. illustrations, which tries to address the same kind of thing. Um, I've been working, when I'm not tied down doing books on digital imaging, I've been sort of working on a book on this general topic. And I, you know, hopefully it will get together one of these days. Um, 
the computer model was, was created for that. And, uh, you know, just working with that. I'd love to show a computer model and stuff like that in real time, but you know what happens with software when you try to demonstrate in front of a lot of people. <laughs> it crashes. But when you, when you move that slider and, and the Milky Way just swings in front of you, you go like, wow. I wish I could show this to everybody. Um, yes, question for that. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, what is the size of the Milky Way, of the galaxy? Um, roughly 100,000 light years across. And we are about, depending on who you talk to, uh, 28 to 24,000 light years from the center. Yes, out there. Do you have a favorite telescope? Favorite telescope? Um, you mean, you mean mine? Probably the best pictures of most objects that we view as amateurs are now done by uh, amateur astronomers. They're, they're better than the stuff from Kit Peak you know, a couple decades ago. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very nice that the amateurs have done stuff and posted it. You can just download it. Um, all you have to do is search. There was a question here? Yes. Which direction is the best chance for finding intelligent life? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's actually a very tricky question. I, I suppose since the density of stars increases quite rapidly as you go inwards, you'd want to look inward, unless it turns out that our galaxy has done something nasty in the, you know, at some point and fried them all. Um, but if you figure that it takes intelligent life on the order of four or five billion years to arise on a reasonable planet, um, if the galaxy has been reasonably well behaved for that length of time, I'd look inwards. Um, but that's just because there's more stars that way. Yes? Do all the stars in this galaxy have a set orbit around the center? Um, no, well, yes and no. They go where gravity leads them. Okay, but gravity is complex when you have when you have two objects, a, you know, a, a, the sun and the earth or something like that. Gravity is very simple. Things go around in a very, very predictable kind of way. As soon as you get a third object, the sun, moon, earth system, um, you can't uniquely solve the equations to know where it's going to be for all time. When you get huge numbers of objects, not only does the star orbit and is affected by the gravity at the center of the galaxy, but it's also affected by every other object and it affects every other object. So you get a very complex system. Um, there was an interesting and uh, an article in, I think it's the October issue of Scientific American about the formation of spiral arms. And what it's dealing with is fundamentally how do the stars in the galaxy interact gravitationally. Um, and it's those interactions gravitationally that um, cause the spiral arms to form. Because if consider that if by chance a bunch of stars orbiting in completely random orbits happened to come close together, there would be more gravity in that direction and you would get a, they would probably pull each other together and you'd get a self-reinforcing effect. It's that kind of thing which actually, what are called gravitational waves, generates the, the um, spiral arms. Um, I sort of lost my train of thought, but... <laughs> Um, well, there's enough, I mean, these things are not going to, I mean, why don't they spiral in and crash on the nucleus? Oh, well, they're, yeah, they're frustrated, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they have their, their potential energy, which is keeping them from, from going in. Um, but uh, the orbits are reasonably well-defined, but they're not absolute. There, there is some chaotic behavior in the system, as you can't, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen because it's too complex uh, to compute.
But don't worry. I mean, we're we're okay for the time being. Oh no doubt. Um. Well. I'm just kind of wondering how everything is is uh, out there. I, I figured maybe it's just like the Earth's been around the sun. All right. You know, it's yeah. I just didn't know why everything just doesn't eventually pull some into one concentrated grain around the sun. What the hell? Um, yeah, well, we're, for the same, I mean, the, the, the sun does not crash into the center of the galaxy for the same reason that the Earth doesn't crash into the sun. It's got enough energy to keep it out and orbiting. It's uh, moving perpendicular to the direction of infall. Um, so, on the other hand, because the galaxy is complex, the sun does not actually go in a simple orbit around it because the thin disk uh, has a lot of other stars in it, and right now we're above the the um, plane of, of all those other stars. We're, our sun is being pulled back down into the thin disk plane, but our velocity happens to be enough right now that we're still going up and away from it, and we will go up to about 40 light years above, and then we'll go back down through it and come out the other side. Um, and so our path through the galaxy is goes up and down like this, and we're also going around. So we're we're doing something like that, like the rim of a pie crust. So, so we're in the pancake, not in the CD. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're actually in the pancake because the CD. I mean, sorry, we're actually in the CD. Um, we're within something like a thousandth of an inch of the center of the CD. The, um, the CD is a thousand light years thick. The, um, the pancake is 3,000 light years thick. What happens is that old stars get interact with one another, get stirred up, and they get kicked out further and further as they get older and older. Um, another interesting thing, since we're talking about gravity, one of the things that the Cassini mission to Saturn is doing Right, Cassini is a similar system. You've got thousands and thousands of you know, house to baseball sized particles of ice orbiting a planet. And their gravity and the gravitation of all the small moons are interacting. And so you get these thousands of rings and you get all this very complex structure. Um, I mean, if you want to see and you think, well, wait a minute, the simple picture of everything going around in circles doesn't hold. Um, but if you look at how complex the rings turn out to be, you realize just how complicated a very simple law like the inverse square law of gravity can make things happen when there's a lot of objects in it. Um, take a look at the Cassini website because they, they think they did a year-end roundup about how you can have spiral ring structures and stuff like that. There was a question in the back, yes? Yeah. Is the rotation of the galaxy increasing, decreasing, constant? Um, I think that's probably an open question. I mean, basically, it's not changing radically. Um, however, there is infall of gas from outside the galaxy. So there's um, neutral hydrogen falling in, um, which is adding energy and changing the system. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other... Seems like there's a lot of parallels between how hurricanes behave and... Oh, well, they certainly look similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, but spirality is not that uncommon um, in, in natural things. I mean, uh, when you stir the cream into the coffee, I mean... You... Is the direction of rotation in our galaxy constant? Or, or, or do the large majority of objects rotate in the same? Most most things are, are going pretty much the same speed in the same direction. Um, but, but the clockwise but, and counterclockwise yeah. relative to our galaxy. Right. Um, and um, as I said, there's this bobbing up and down. Um, and there's also, it's not a circular orbit, it's a somewhat elliptical orbit. And then on large scale pattern, the star, I mean, on large scale structure, the stars, most of them will be in, in somewhat elliptical orbits. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen a good description in print anywhere. I can't think off the top of my head, but I know that there's, I knew some guys in graduate school who were doing that kind of work, who were doing the computer models. 
Um, I mean, if you if, if you have any familiarity with computers and you want to have some fun, program a, a 10,000 star galaxy, self-gravitating, and watch it run. Um, and I mean, this is what people are trying to do now to study this kind of stuff. They're trying to get up, you know, somewhere in the million star range with supercomputers to actually see this kind of stuff evolve. Okay. Okay, one more question if there are... are Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose the way to rephrase it is, <laughs> is, is um, basically there's a hierarchy of structures where you have uh, things like the local group, which has maybe three big members and 30 small members, um, which is part of a, uh, a number of other aggregations, like a group of galaxies centered around M51, another group around M81, M82. Um, so there's, there tends to be these small-scale aggregations, and um, probably the next step up in the hierarchy is that our smaller groups are peripheral members of the Virgo cluster. Um, on a very large scale, um, things like the Virgo cluster tend to be aligned in kind of stringy or shell-shaped structures in space. Indeed, one of the things that this kind of stuff has been modeled, but we have, when you look at distant galaxies, you don't have too much information about their, their true motions. Um, all you have is the radial line of sight. So we know that Andromeda galaxies and, and us are coming together at a rate of about 100 kilometers a second, which is pretty fast, but it's pretty distant. Um, so there's, and we observe in other groups that galaxies eventually will orbit each other and sometimes collide. So presumably, if that's an indication in other places, we will eventually do that too. Okay. okay. We have um, two telescopes and a pair of binoculars to raffle tonight, and if you haven't yet gotten a ticket, we want to give you a few minutes to do it. Congratulations. We're going to ask Richard Berry to draw the uh, second one. In the interest of fairness, This is for the refractor. He likes small scopes, so we're going to go. Okay. Two, four, one. Eight, three, two, zero, two, four, one is the number. Two, four, one. All right, we have a winner. Comes with two eyepieces too, uh, so you got a great deal. A nine millimeter and a 25 millimeter. Congratulations. <laughs> Esther is drawing the grand prize, the eight inch Dobsonian with the tail rad. Okay, one, seven, five. Eight three two zero one seven five. Here we go. We have a winner.
It is. We can confirm it. Congratulations. Uh, both of these scopes I want to mention were donated by, well, this one was donated by Greg People, who is the, uh, the uh, sophisticated sun imager in our, uh, in our club. And um, this came from him and also from the club, the 70 millimeter uh, Acromat as well. So thank you very much to Greg People for these donations. Thank you guys for coming out. He wants both.